Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see all of you here with us today. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We have come here today to worship God and to be together and to celebrate both our being together and God's love for us. And so we do welcome you today. Uh, I think uh, I'm going to have announcements now. And the first thing I want to say is that we have heat here in the sanctuary. And so we are so pleased to have heat in the sanctuary. And so we hope you're enjoying it today. Uh, I'm enjoying it. And so uh, uh, we're, we're grateful to MG and all the work he does and everything. He keeps this place going in so many ways. Uh, he and Kim do. And so we are grateful for that. There are some announcements that need to be made here that I want to make today. Uh, first of all, I want to go ahead and thank uh, Jim and Phyllis March today uh, for the wonderful breakfast that we had. I hope that you showed up for this. And MG also, Jim is pointing at MG. And so I, I, I've already thanked MG one time, but I'm going to thank him again. You, you can't get thanked enough, you know. So we are grateful for Jim, for Phyllis, for Kim, for MG, and for all you guys do for us. It was a wonderful time to be together. Uh, if you don't know this, and I'm going to do this with the children at some time, Jesus was big on table fellowship, which means you sit down and you eat with people and you get to know them. We do that every Sunday here at First Presbyterian Church after the worship service, which is my lead-in to say to you that I hope you do come today after the worship service over to the fellowship hall. It's out these double doors and then to the left through two more double doors, but I hope you do come to fellowship today so that we can all be together. Now, I have been uh, asked to announce that the PW Monthly Luncheon, the Presbyterian Women, is going to be happening on the 21st uh, this next week. Not this week. This week. Gosh, I, lo I lost it there, guys. Tuesday. And so... I think I got sidetracked because there's something happening called the Dirty Bunny or something like that. And so uh, I'm going to be anxious to see what Marinell brings home. I think, I think it's somewhere between $10 and $15 on, on, this, on this Dirty Bunny thing. And so uh, uh, if anybody wants to give me a Dirty Bunny, I'll accept it gladly. So, so uh, all right, let me continue on. I'm just rambling on here, guys. Uh, we are going to order Easter lilies for Easter Sunday. Uh, so please know about that. See that in your bulletin. Uh, the other thing we want to go ahead and say is that our week four of Lenten devotional booklets are in the narthex. I uh, see I've done breakfast. I've done the Lenten Bible study, Presbyterian women. I want to give you a, a personal thank you for being with us this past Sunday afternoon in the fellowship hall where we did our work for the interim time here between Pastor Sharon and, and the next person who will come after me here. We called it who and where we were. So many of you showed up for this, came out for this, and it was such a good time to be together. I personally learned a lot. I want you to know that there are results of our of our meeting this past Sunday that are in the narthex. I want you to get a copy if you would like to see that. It's very instructive. There are questions that people responded to as a group, and so I want you to see those results. Uh, there is going to be a second session that is coming up, and there is a date for that, uh, but right now I don't have it right in front of me, and so I'm not going to try to do that. I do want to go ahead and get it out there in front of you. It's not in your, in your worship bulletin here. But I do want to get it in front of you that we are having a Monday, Thursday service here at First Presbyterian Church. And I want you to know we're going to go ahead and stick with the time of 3 p.m. in the afternoon. We did that uh, during, uh, we did that during um, Ash Wednesday. And we had a really good turnout for that. We know it's not going to be dark until later. But the 3 p.m. time really seemed to work for us. And so we're going to keep it at that time 
And, uh, and so I want to alert you to that. Uh, Holy Week is coming up, folks, and, and so that's going to be a very high time in the life of the church. I have rambled on enough. I've done the announcements and more this morning. Please excuse me for rambling. That's why I have a script a lot of times is because I do ramble. And so if you would please bow your heads and join me in prayer, I would appreciate it. Let us pray. Oh God, you have always been our help in ages past, a steadying hand when we trembled, a solid rock when the waters rose above us. We praise you today for the gift of your love, for the many times you have come to our aid when we did not even realize we were in danger. You have saved us to this moment and brought us together in this place to worship you. Give us a strong sense of your holy presence that we may come and leave here today in the assurance that you have once more touched our lives and made us whole. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray, amen. As you are able, would you please stand for the call to worship? We come to sanctify ourselves. We We come come seeking to be worthy of our call. The Lord looks not at our outward selves, but seeks to know what is in our hearts. Let us learn what is pleasing to the Lord, that that we we might live live as children of of the Most High. High.
How do we know when our actions are right, when the fruits of our labors, labor are good and true? Christ is the light that exposes all we keep hidden, but offers us healing and renewal instead of judgment. Therefore, let us hold up our sins to Christ's gaze as we pray together the prayer of compassion printed in our bulletin, followed by a moment of silent meditation. Let us pray. God of compassion and mercy, we sometimes fail to see what you are doing in the world. We want you to act in ways we predict, but we forget you do what is good, not what is expected. Forgive us when we do not recognize your miracles. Forgive us when we doubt the wisdom of your actions. Most of all, forgive us when we do not respond to your call, ignoring what we need to do, to, which is show the world your love and peace. Amen. Jesus restores our souls and leads us in right paths for his name's sake. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us in all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord our whole lives long. Amen. Please be seated. I have it on good authority that our young disciples are on vacation for a couple of weeks, and so we are missing our young disciples, but they will be back. I want to assure you of that. And so we will go ahead and continue on with our order of worship now. Let us pray. O oh God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that being taught by you in Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds might be open to know the things that pertain to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Our scripture lesson today is Psalm 51 verses 15 through 17. In your pew Bible, it is located on page 521 of the Old Testament. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our scripture lesson comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. That is located here. My notes say it's located on page 192 of the New Testament. Listen now for the voice of God in Holy Scripture. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I am not sure that I should be known as a Christian. Not that I don't want to be a Christian, but that I should be thought of as a Christian. For when we think of what it means to be a Christian, we think of high ideals, we think of pure motives, and we think of sincere actions. We think of living our daily lives by the Bible. And yet, if I am honest with you, when I look inside my own life, I find ulterior motives. I find insincerity. I find double-mindedness. I find the savoring of success. Things that I am afraid to admit to you or to me. If people knew this, I'm not sure they would like me. And so I pretend. I pretend to be a good Christian, and I use this pretending to defend my life. I tell myself that I really am a good person, and God accepts, accepts me because I am good which ends up blinding me to God's grace. I'm counting on my goodness rather than God's grace. Now, when we were little, I don't know how it was with you, but I like to pretend when I was little. We imagine ourselves being someone else. I know that when I was small, I liked to be Henry Aaron, the great baseball, important, uh, the great baseball player. And basically, I wanted to be Henry because I wanted to feel important. And it was easy because all I had to do was put on different clothes or pick up a baseball bat, and I became this admired person, Henry Aaron. If you don't remember, Henry, Henry Aaron was for many years the home run king, and then he, he played for the Milwaukee Braves first, and then second, he played for the Atlanta Braves. What I would do is when no one was looking, I would go out into our backyard and I would try to swing the bat just like Henry swung the bat. Folks, we continue to pretend as adults. We imagine being well known or worthy of respect. We act in ways that we think others will approve. It is easy to pretend and it makes, us feel, it makes us feel good and important. When we pretend, we put on a show. We convince others that we really are good people. We do this because perhaps they will find out that we're not so good after all, and they will not accept us if they knew what we were really like, if they saw our doubts, if they saw our fears, 
if they saw our hurts, if they saw our problems. We pretend not only to others, but we pretend to ourselves as well. We want to believe we are worth something, and so we act in ways we think are worthy and we imagine being admired by others. And by doing this, we convince ourselves that we really are good and we really are important. Now, we also pretend to God on occasions. For we sometimes think of God as being like a person we must impress to be accepted. There's a really interesting book. I haven't read it in a while, but I found it in my notes. It's a book by Soren Kierkegaard. The name of the book is Attack Upon Christendom. Here's what he says. Where all are Christians, the situation is this. To call ourselves a Christian is the way that we secure ourselves against all sorts of inconveniences and discomforts. And tradition flourishes in the land. No heresy, no schism, tradition everywhere. The tradition which consists in playing the game of Christianity. Now, Kierkegaard's attack was directed toward a 19th century state church where everybody in Denmark was born a Christian. Everybody was officially proclaimed a Christian at their birth as an infant. Here's what Kierkegaard is saying. Kierkegaard is saying that when we are with other Christians, we have a tendency to play the game of Christianity. Whenever we are in a church, whenever we are in a prayer group, we find it hard to avoid imitating Christianity. Playing the game of Christianity, folks, is going through the motions without having the reality of being a Christian inside of you, within you. It is pretending to be a Christian instead of being a Christian for real. More subtly, it is living outside ourselves which means identifying with a group in much the same way we identified with our childhood heroes. We are playing at something that is really outside of us and not genuinely us. So what is behind pretending? What is behind playing at Christianity? Two deep-seated motives cause us to pretend, I believe the need for approval, and the tendency of self-justification, which I'll call very simply making, excuse, making excuses for ourselves. Self-justification is making excuses for ourselves and defending ourselves. Now, none of us wants to be too different. We want other people's approval. Sometimes we want it desperately. We act in ways that bring that approval. Everyday, ordinary ways and spiritual ways as well. Underneath us, though, this need for approval is the need for self-esteem, the need for a sense of worth. And sometimes we go to great lengths to get this sense of worth. When we are part of a church, we can gain this sense of worth by acting in ways that the group approves. Also underneath the need for approval is the need to feel, is, is, the, is the need to overcome feeling separate and alone. Folks, each of us feels and is afraid that we will be left out. Honestly, I don't want to be left out. And we can overcome this by attracting others to us, which we do by showing how good we are at being Christians. The need to feel that we are good is behind the need to defend our behavior. 
which drives us to do things we think will impress other people. We feel our lives have worth when we do things we know will make our Christian sisters and brothers think that we are spiritual. What tends to happen then, folks, when we are part of a church is that we adopt our church's beliefs and practices, not out of personal conviction, but because of our need for approval. Our actions and our words, even our feelings, sometimes are really not even our own. Our faith is someone else's. We become impersonators. Now, for years, my reaction to this Ephesians passage that I read earlier has been, you know, I don't believe in salvation by works. I know that it's grace uh, by grace that we are saved and not because of our works, Paul writes, lest anyone should boast. That was my same reaction to the Ten Commandments. I don't believe in cheating. I don't believe in lying. I don't believe in killing. And I don't do those things. But God gave us the Ten Commandments because we do have the impulse to cheat. We do have the impulse to lie. We do have the impulse to kill, as radical as that sounds. All of these feelings are within us. And when I looked at my impulses, there they were also, honestly. It's the same with Paul's rejection of making excuses Defending ourselves, again, self-justification. Paul knew how intensely we try to justify ourselves, to tell ourselves that we are good by any means we can other than by God's grace. These are the reasons it is easy to pretend to play the game of Christianity. These are the reasons pretending and playing at Christianity have a certain satisfaction. They come from our fundamental needs, and we have an image to maintain. Churches also have an image to maintain. We want to show that being a Christian makes a difference, and Christ transforms our lives. True as these are, they push us to cover up our problems, to pretend that everything is okay, and ultimately to justify and defend ourselves because of how we live. This whole thing about justification, the strength of self-justification is best illustrated in the difficulty we have in receiving gifts from other people or from God. We want to give something back in order to even the score or show that we are as good as the giver. That's what's going on many times. The same is true in accepting God's grace. We sometimes want, we sometimes find ourselves wanting to give something back to God not so much as a response of gratitude, but as a way of showing that we are really worthy of God's grace. We want to even the score so we can show that we are not so helpless as the gift of grace implies. To know that God loves us not because we are good, but just because is hard. We want to convince God that we are pretty decent people whom God should admire. But of course, with God, there is no way that we can even things up. There is no way that we can show we deserve God's gift. And quite honestly, I don't believe that God is very much impressed with our games to convince God that we are admirable. I know that in a way we need to pretend because we need to feel good and important. I get it. I really do. 
Yet we despise pretending also because we want to be real and genuine deep inside. I believe we know that. So we're caught in a quandary. We can't help but pretend, and yet we also hate it. Now, folks, there are at least two kinds of reactions that we can have toward pretenders. We can point them out. You can point me out, just as we do with hypocrites. How delightful and gratifying this can be. But what a surprise when we suddenly realize that someone is pointing their finger at us. Or we can see pretenders as people who are genuinely hurt. When we are hurt, we want someone to notice us and to understand us. And when this happens, we open up. Our shell has been broken. We don't have to pretend anymore. We feel accepted in spite of our wounds. Our need to impress melts away. Perhaps this is how God's grace works. We pretenders are hurt. We sometimes doubt our faith. We are lonely. We are wondering if people really do like us. We fight off our conscience as past problems spring into our minds. We wrestle with self-rejection and feelings of inadequacy. Some of us have been betrayed by people we love, criticized or neglected, and are deeply, deeply wounded by the memory. Many of us are restless, searching for something more, sometimes with quiet desperation, wanting to tell someone, yet even more so afraid of doing. Folks, honestly, I would rather we not admire each other as Christians, but think of each other as being hurt, having fears and doubts, wondering sometimes what the point of life is, being afraid to love, having temptations, trying to impress other people to cover up our self-doubt, people whose inner spiritual lives are sometimes confused with ulterior motives, just like I have. And when we see this in each other and in ourselves, it's then that we can drop the barriers. It is then that we can put our arms around each other. We then, might be with, we then might be able to take off some of our masks. We might then not strive for success so much or see our success as the source of our self-worth. Maybe we would feel freer to be ourselves instead of someone else, freer to have our own faith instead of someone else's faith. Maybe we would feel in our hearts and not just in our minds that our faith is not just playing a game. Perhaps then we would experience God's grace more than fleeting, scattered moments. Is there any other way to stop pretending than by God's grace? What else can heal our wounds and our hearts? Only God's grace can satisfy our restless hearts. Amen. Let us pray. Giving God, help us to understand how much we truly need you and that our own resources are not able to satisfy our deepest needs. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Folks, our affirmation of faith is printed in the bulletin today. It is the Apostles' Creed. Let us stand together and say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As is our usual custom here, we take this time now to invite you to profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We also invite you to unite in membership with us here at First Presbyterian Church in Fort Walton Beach. If you are interested in either membership or discipleship, I would love to visit with you after the service of worship to die today, or if, you would be, if it would be more convenient to you, please call the church office and we will set up a time for us to visit. As the offertory is played, let us remember how we should live in gratitude for everything and then share what we have with others.
Let us pray. When we look around us, O oh Lord, at the world of beautiful beaches, trees, flowers, and loving friends, we realize that we live every day with your grace. Now we say thank you, Lord, for how constant your love is for us. May we be half as careful in caring for those around us whose world may not appear as wonderful as ours. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. O oh God who loves us always, including this very moment, we thank you for what we hear and see this morning. For the sound of birds singing as we awakened. For the views of trees and grass around our homes for the touch of our friends and loved ones, for the taste of food on our tongues, for the magnificence of the church organ, the presence of others in the pews, the awareness of something special in this place. Now let all of that fade away, that we may feel your presence most of all, and know that all else has meaning because of you. Having created the world, you have entered it to save it through Jesus Christ. Our hope is in him and his dream for the world as your kingdom. Help us now trusting in him to surrender all our problems. Let us not rely upon ourselves, but upon you that your love may flow through us, healing us, redirecting us, and exciting us. We remember today, O oh God, all who are heavy-hearted, all who suffer through illness, all who feel confusion or fear or loneliness. Speak to us today that the world of our senses may become even more sharp to sing your love. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, singing together.
And now may God who gives us life and love nourish us with the sunlight of God's presence that we may grow in all spiritual graces. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.